Okay. Okay. So welcome to everybody uh, to, the, to the 2017 uh, edition of the course Interdisciplinary Studies on Internet uh, and Society. Uh, today we are uh, very pleased to have uh, Jasmina Tetsanovic and Bruce Sterling. Uh, actually, the, the, my presentation would be my introduction will be very short because I think you 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 know very well them. Uh, uh, journalist, uh, science novelist, uh, authors, uh, what else? Uh, did I forget? Uh, musicians. Musicians. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Design critics. <laughs> exactly. So, um, they speak about uh, the project of Casa Jasmina. So, I won't tell you nothing because uh, they are here for, for, for tell you more. And uh, I just remind you that the examination uh, will be on next Friday, uh, 30th of uh, June. It will be quite simple like, examination, uh, closed uh, options, questions. And uh, it's just important to, to, to participate uh, actively to the, to the lectures to, in order to be able to, to pass it. Okay? And if you have any questions, please write to the staff uh, of Nexa Center at info uh, at nexa.polito.it. Uh, okay, that's all from my side. Great. Okay. So what a pleasant little crowd. It's like we're having lunch at Casa Yasmina. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Bruce Sterling, and this is Yasmina Tishampich. And I'm from Austin, and she's from Belgrade, Belgrado. Uh, so we got married and we spent a lot of time in Torino, because that makes sense. Uh, so we uh, have a particularly favorite Turinese project, which is Casa Yasmina, which we'll be talking about now. This is where Casa Yasmina is. It's in the uh, former uh, industrial Fiat building, which was abandoned in the 1970s, in Via Egeo 16. And uh, you know, one of the regional competitive advantages of Torino is that uh, it's got these empty buildings where you can just kind of come in and retrofit it and the city will help you. And that's why we were able to put together this housing project because basically we didn't have to pay any rent. Okay, well, it's more complicated than that. I would say yeah, it's more complicated. easy than that, but it's always about me and him. Do you hear me? I mean, yes. I don't need a mic, do I? Oh, no. Okay, so I was just saying like, um, we've been now in Torino for 10 years, huh? And we, we've been living in rented places, and we're like old enough to decide after many years of nomadic life to, okay, we'll have a house of our own, and it should be a different home. So the idea of Casa Yasmina really started because we wanted to make a private space of our own. It wasn't like we never had this thing of doing a project, you know. But being who we are, and being sitting in Fab Lab and uh, co-working space very often because our fast web internet in San Salvador was horrible, you know, and it was like a deal breaker for us. So we're sitting all day, huh? So then at that point, I saw this flag, which was half ruined and was look, this is how it looked. It was abandoned. It was a potentially beautiful space, and I thought, like, why don't we ask these people? Can be like everybody was uh, not squatting, but they were like. Uh, conquering the territory of this abandoned beautiful building from 1919. And I said, like, why don't we ask the owner if we could, like, um, buy it? It should be very cheap. And then we can make this crazy shit, like, we can make a different house, you know, like, different, which doesn't have to have furniture, like, start from scratch, and you all. And unfortunately, the flat could not be um, s sold because it was uh, supposed to be um, torn down, you know, demolizione. But it could be rented. The idea, uh, the people around us, like Massimo Bandi, Davide Gomba, you know, Aurelio Balas, said, well, the idea is great anyway. You know, why don't you do it anyway? You can't buy it. But so at that point, we said, okay, we will do it. And it was called Casa Yasmina because it was my idea, but it is a private idea. And we had to get another house at that point for us, you know, which we could buy in the range, which is parallelly starting with Casa Yasmina. Okay. Right. Well, you know, Massimo Banzi, one of the founders of Arduino, uh, says, I think quite rightly, that you shouldn't organize, you shouldn't involve yourself in an open source project unless you're solving a problem of your own. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, as two foreigners who live in Torino and come from very different cultures, we have a genuine problem in, like, how we want to live daily life. 
And we find that, you know, um, having, the, having the capacities of Fab Lab Torino and the Arduino office actually help us with some of our personal problems, like, okay, we don't have to go to the furniture store and fight about what kind of furniture we want. They've got, like, laser cutters, 3D printers, routers. They've got a robot downstairs. They can do all these kinds of maker-style interventions. And we happen to be quite keen on maker culture. I was one of the original columnists for Make Magazine, and I knew a lot of people in this kind of, uh, this kind of maker world. So we found that, you know, we could we could cooperate uh, on a kind of maker level and really solve a lot of our personal issues there. And uh, right. No, and it's also like when we came there, there were only rats and pigeons, which is, uh, it was being inhabited by... But our was, first guests. Yeah, our first guests. That's our first guest. But it had great internet, you know, so we spent a whole night, like, it was winter also, you know, so we were like, we brought a sleeping bag, you know, a bottle of wine, and you know, we we tried to make like a tent because we didn't even have windows. We found a place, but it was a very good experience, you know. We cannot make nowadays. Very few people make uh, with their own hands, flat. but you know, a lot of people are thinking on building tents on you know immigrants or you know refugees from all over sorts of climate refugees, you know. So it's a very. I think it's a very important experience that you pass one night. Then we heard like the the space, where the pigeons come from, where the rats come from, where the trains come from, you know. So you can think about the space in a different way than when you enter a building, like the other building that we entered as an already done flat, which we had, we already bought it, and only now we know what's really going on there, you know. Because there is no perfect space, but you can make it perfect by, you know, especially in an urban place like that. Right. So we had a lot of help in this. I mean, it is an issue that she and I want to solve. So, you know, we're willing to kind of engage with this and devote a lot of energy to it. Uh, but mostly we have staffers and guests, or guests and staffers. So here's Casa Yasmina very early on. It still didn't have heating, it didn't have lighting. And here's some, you know, a group of open source enthusiasts who come up and just start building lamps. They're really just like the open source cola lamp. It's like, we've got no lamps, there's nothing in here. We've just chased off the rats and pigeons. Well, let's just start at the beginning. So they all just come in and do their own lamps. Then we had the, our first guests who showed up, that's Peter Beer and Michelle Thorne from Mozilla Foundation and their big open source software and hardware enthusiasts. So they were the first people to volunteer to live in there and kind of treat it as the guest house of the Arduino office and the, and the uh, uh, Torino Fab Lab. And they were very helpful. I mean, they were, they were like really willing to you know, study what's going on and tell us what we need. It's like there's no shampoo, there's no hair dryer, uh, you know. Uh, it's very loud at night. I mean, it has a lot, it had a lot of serious problems. But, you know, more and more people showed up. Here's like uh, Samantha Christopher Reddy, the astronaut, and, uh, and uh, Paola Antonelli, the design curator for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So at this time, you know, by this time, we're really starting to class it up. I mean, we, We've got really some top-level design people who drop by and give us advice, and they're really, I mean, they don't give us money, but they just, like, point out problems, and we're like, okay, we'll do our best, you know, we'll kind of get rid of, get rid of that, but they're, they're interested in it as a volunteer effort. I mean, if we were a business, we would have had to hire them, and we can't afford astronauts or design curators, but since we're doing this social intervention in Torino, we can see people who are, you know, have kindly feelings about that kind of collaborative culture. You're coming in through the tour, and there's Massimo Bonzi, and they're in the Fab Lab. And you can see this guy who's actually working in the Fab Lab is completely unimpressed by the celebrities, which <laughs> I think is always kind of great. I and mean, people are really going about their own business in there, right? I mean, the Fab Lab is like a very vital part of Torino, and it's constantly spinning out these projects. And if you're doing something that belongs in a domestic context, like inside a house, now you have a house that you can put it in, right? I mean, you have a place to display your, your efforts and kind of, you don't have to just take them home to your mom. You can actually have somebody use them and, you know, kind of take them upstairs and test them and have celebrities sleep on them or maybe you'll get some advice. So that's been uh, helpful. Uh, the problem with, uh, the problem with, uh, and having all these brilliant young people in Flat Lab. Huh? And when we started doing Casa Yasmina, was that, there were, as you mentioned, they 
always wanted to make chairs and lamps because this is like the manual of Arduino, how to make a chair and how to make a lamp, you know. And they are brilliant, they can do anything you tell them that's true and it's really a pity they were not doing anything useful. So this is like a big mom <laughs> that I came and said, look, they're all men by the way. Eh? So I said, look, we should do something that really, you know, those lamps and chairs, and chairs were so uncomfortable. You know, first of all, it would make a good chair. First, you have to know the ergonomics. It's not about, you know, you have to be comfortable, you know. And lamps, you know, I needed a different lamp. It looks beautiful, yes, but, you know, like, I'm half blind, you know. I, I need a lamp where I really see, and I don't want it to go over my head and kill me while I'm sleeping, you know, that kind of stuff. So, the problem with these brilliant guys, you know, was that they were doing something from the manuals, and they were not doing something for everyday use, you know. And the good part of these guests that came to stay with us, you know, they because they were activists, internet activists like us, and and they were like willing to spend the night even on the floor, on a bed which is not enough good, or the contrary, because you see, I have an experience. We bought like all these smart things. I call it a smart uh house for even smarter people but what happens is that i don't want my mattress to outsmart me and i did get a mattress which was too smart for me because you know i would lie on that mattress it was a very expensive one we kind of you know invested money because it's important half of your life you're sleeping on this you know you heard about that mattress so they're like uh, 100 euro mattress, 500 euro mat uh, unto 5,000. So we bought like a range of mattresses. And what I found out by sleeping on this mattress, and now this is very important for your designers and stuff, is that, you know, the fact that they're smart and they go around your body, it's not really necessarily good for your body. It means you sleep more, you don't turn around, and you wake up very stiff. You know, like your neck really hurts. And this is not only my experience, but I wrote about it. And I heard other people having the same experiences, you know. And when our guests came there, they were willing to sit there and lie in our beds, you know, and use all our things. And being mostly brilliant designers, you know, or thinkers, they even wrote a book, you know, Michelle Thorne and Peter Beer. The first time they got there, they wrote a little book, you know, about uh, what's good, what's bad about it. Was that it was derived from an immediate experience uh, of living there and confronting it culturally, you know, like they're German people. I mean, she's American, he's German, he's American, Texan, that's different, <laughs> and I'm Serbian. But, you know, cultural differences are also very important, you know, because some people say, we don't even need a table, Americans wear California, everything walking, you know. So this is the problems of resolving a smart house of the so-called future have uh, come from different sides, and they're not really problems. You just no, have to they're, more like, them. they're more like opportunities. Yeah. What kind of challenges? Like, if you're making an open source chair and you've never made a chair in your life, you think, boy, it's really a triumph for me to make a chair. But, you know, there are thousands of chairs in the world. And, you know, you've like learned to do one, but you haven't necessarily solved the problem of somebody who actually wants to be in a chair. So, you know, here we have a space that's really got three different functions. You know, first, it's a place for people to test things that they're making. And, you know, second, it's a place to show off things so the public can come and see it. And then third, it's an actual place where people stay. I mean, we have guests. I mean, it's the guest hotel, really, for Fab Lab Torino, for the Arduino office, and for, for Toolbox co-working, and even the little print shop downstairs in Via Ingeo. I mean, if, you're, if you happen to be in this you know, design fortress, I guess you can call it now, this retrofitted factory, it's very handy to be able to have a place to sleep and to eat and to wash and, you know, so you can go out and collaborate and kind of be okay about it, you know, go work in the fab lab and so forth. So we get people who are very interested in fab labs and who know a lot about the situation, but they're really more like maker professionals or, you know, design teachers or kind of, you know, open source hardware gurus of various kinds. So, you know, when you put something in there, they're really going to like, Confront the you know confront the realities of it. It's not enough that you made it. It's got to actually function in a domestic context. So we we're getting a lot of. I mean, we're not a business. Yasmina and I are not employees. Because Yasmina has a budget, sort of. But you know, like a lot of open source hardware projects, it's more of a communal labor thing. People come in, they contribute something, they leave. All right. If you've never been involved in open source production, this is just like the nature of this means of production. It's not as capitalist as other ways. It's not, it, you know, it, 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 it does, you don't have to please your shareholders. There's a lot of things that you're free from, but then you have other constraints. 
which you know you don't know about unless you're doing it. Like who repairs it? Or how do you decide to get rid of something? Or what happens when somebody just doesn't want to collaborate anymore? And this is very common for Kaze Yasmina staffers. They'll come in for like 12 months, 18 months. Okay, I know all about open source furniture now. I'm, I'm going to go to Shanghai or you know, Singapore or New York or Berlin. And they do. <laughs> and there's no reason for us to make them stay, right? I mean, they collaborated. They like learned what they had to learn, right? And you know, it's over for them. And you know, the same is true for us. I mean, we said that this would be a two-year project for us, and we were building our own house at the time. And we, now we've completed our own house, and our two years are also gone. So now we have this little house that actually works pretty well. I mean, people are happy there. You can cook, you can sleep, you can eat. It's funny, it's delightful, it has a nice garden. It's in Italy, you know. If you're like visiting from Torino and you're like some kind of open source geek, you're like, wow, you know, it's like, I can stay in Torino and it's like an open source house in the future. They'll be nice to me. It's like, yeah. Okay, where do we go from there? Is okay, there? I want to say something about the staffers, please. So, um, the staffers were the, uh, when we were, when the people who were there in the beginning and then the people who came afterwards, you know, I noticed at a certain point that they were all men. All young men, you know, but men, you know, and this is a little bit the situation in Italy. It's all of them like that, but especially in Torino and Italy. And at that point, I realized that, you know, nothing wrong with men, but I'm a hardcore feminist, you know, and men, it's just not normal to have a house without women, without children, without thinking about old people, you know, even old, you know. So, and they call themselves, they're very nice people. They call, I mean, young guys, you know, they, they, they call themselves Yasmini, you know, which is really a victory condition to have the female name turned into male name, because it's usually vice versa to victory, you know. But I had to write a, a, a manifesto. I had to find women. So I started, like, going around the Fab Lab and everything. Why don't you come, you know, I'm not a designer, but please tell me, you know, please tell me, why are you not sitting where the men are sitting? You know, why I'm not participating? Some were saying, so they told me, you know, and I managed to write seven points why women are think differently, how they work differently, you know, and uh, the I, we made a big, uh, uh, you see, this is a big, it is a Campiello manifesto, and we made it, instead of being the girl of electricity, this is the girl of Casa Yasmina, holding the Casa Yasmina, this is the girl of internet, you know, because it's all connected to women, you know, and the very good thing is like even though the project, uh, this thing is going on because it's tracking, it's taking traction all over the world. Because even they, if, if even if they come from California, we're in San Diego last year, where women are, uh, are much more empowered, let's say, taking te no more of technology than, let's say, in Serbia, you know, where they're hackers, they're big hackers. They're, they still have this problem, not so much being politically discriminated, but uh, not having the space that they would have quality space, you know, quality time. They would think different. And for domotica, for things like that, it's so important that you have a different kind of thinking because then you have the chairs which are not comfortable, the changers for babies which are too high, you know, because women are, generally speaking, lower, you know. And this is like the things that make one uh, our house, which is not a luxury house, it is a house, we call it open source Luso. So for open source, it is luxurious, because, but for Lusso, it's not really Armani's house or the one we saw in Salone del Mobile, which was horrible. I mean, it was beautiful. But after half an hour, you want to go home, you know. You want, you want to see your own dirt, you know. You want to see your own uh, little things, which is not perfect order. You want to see children, you know, which are you, who are using spaces, like we have a children's room, you know, where we throw children and try not to get them killed. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, designing for the home and designing for the family is very difficult politically. And there's been a lot of efforts to design interactive gadgets for the home and the kind of Internet of Things space, and most of them go broke pretty quickly because they just don't work within the habits of domestic life. And also, they, they don't work within the political structure of the family. Because let's just say you've invented an app on a phone that can automatically lock all the doors, which is very common. I mean, we have a door lock on Casa Yasmina too. But the problem is, okay, who has access to the lock? It used to be that the six-year-old could go out and play in the yard. Now he has to go find dad and nag him for permission to leave the house. And father's suddenly been turned into the jailer of the house, right? 
if somebody tries to go and automate mom's laundry routine, uh, you know, and mom has been doing laundry since she was 12, and doesn't really want some guy from Google to tell her how to do laundry in some more theoretically efficient way, because she already knows how to keep her family clothed and fed and so forth. So there have been a lot of disastrous virtual, you know, venture capital efforts in automating homes over many decades. Uh, you know, right now the only really big hit within the Internet of Things space is the new smart speaker business, which come from Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, where you have these soda water bottle-like devices like the Amazon Alexa that will talk to you, answer questions, play music, and so forth. The reason those are popular is because children and women and old people can use them. You just talk to them. You don't have to have the remote control device in your hand, right? I, I just have to intervene here. It's not like women and uh, women and children and old people are less smart, you know? On the contrary, because I really had such good uh, uh, interventions from women like I, I myself am not a designer, you know? I think I designed a couple of brilliant things. I still still produce them like a, a smart laundry line, and you know, and <laughs> I mean, if I say brilliant, you know, it doesn't really mean uh, I, I'm really not so because I, I think uh, we we think from a different point of view. It's just the diversity we're speaking of. It's not like yeah. no, it's more a question. It's not a question of who's smarter because you know a little kid is very smart for a little kid. Mm. It's just that you've like gone and like sidelined and you're not allowing that kid to have the healthy life that a child should have because you're imposing some kind of internet of things command and control authority over somebody who's six. I mean, you're not their dad, you're not their mom, you're not their priest, you're not their school teacher. You know, by what right do you have to like impose algorithms on the daily life of this child who's like discovering his own reality? You know, and he's a child now, but someday he's going to bury you. I mean, you need to have some design respect for this person as a future citizen, right? Yeah, so it's like, it's an ethical problem. And it has nothing to do with, like, I'm smart because I understand the algorithm or I can work, out, work the pull-down menus. I mean, smartness has very little to do with these hits like the Amazon Alexa and so forth. I mean, what they're doing is just, like, extracting privacy out of the home, selling it to advertisers, and then providing you free services. Yeah, that doesn't make you a genius. But, you know, so, you know, I mean, these are like, I mean, these are issues that people in Kaza Yasmina gather to talk about, and we get a lot of ideologues um, of this subject. And in fact, we've been doing it so long that we're ideologues ourselves. I mean, here's uh, an early work of mine from about 10 years ago, which is about the future of the Internet of Things, or a possible future of the Internet of Things. And, uh, you know, uh, life with ubiquitous computing and, and these other kinds of issues. They've been coming along for a long time. Domotica is 40 years old in Italy. Uh, you know, you have a command and control mechanization building here and we're inside it. It's not a new idea, right? Uh, what it is, is, um, you know, it's social innovation. Yeah. Just like, what is our civilization going to look like under these circumstances? The new idea here, because all these workshops that we had and about speaking about IoT and IOW, too, especially for the women thing, that like, it's like uh, Bruce says, post internet there. Most of the time, the people are speaking of not wanting to have internet, like of designing like uh, firewalls in some private spaces. You know, like how can I have my kitchen not being connected to anything but to my you know, because of the Google, Apple, and blah, blah, blah the five big uh, guys, I mean, the issue of privacy is, you know, it's Snowden thing, it's WikiLeaks thing, so, and the fact that they are in our pockets with smartphones, and, you know, it's, it's a big issue. And we all want, it, it's certainly like a, a, a excellent thing to have something, I, 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 the technological revolution is really something that emancipated women, you know, in the 20th century. And this is going to be something that, we man that could emancipate all of us unless we become uh, political slaves. I don't believe that we're going to be technological slaves. Besides, it's not so difficult to uh, to open uh, open source uh, this kind of stuff. So you can do it, especially if you live in the place where you need to open it for yourself. Well, you could do it specifically in Torino. I don't think that Yasmina would have done this in Belgrade, and I would not have done it in Austin. But, you know, Torino has got, like, enough design credibility and especially, like, enough creativity on the ground that you can actually do such a thing. So, you know, here we are becoming famous. This is like Avatare, I think, as kind of gurus of Casa Yasmina. 
you know, and we are gurus of Kaz Yasmin, and we are in a dialogue with the future because we're writers, but the fact that it's actually a real space with real objects in it is what actually gives it some, uh, some traction. You know, it's not a science fiction story about a house. It's not, you know, a TV series about a house. It's an actual domestic space, or something that looks like a domestic space. So, you know, we, we've been at it for a couple of years, and it's kind of settling down a little bit. It's got, like, its own aesthetic. This is what I would call the Casa Yasmina look. It's kind of plywood and projectors. I mean, you know, here you've got, oh, let me just use my laser here. Okay, here we've got, like, a new media heritage item from the National Museum of Cinema in downtown Torino and the Mole Antonelliana over there. That's a zoetrope. Whoop. There we go. So that's a zoetrope. This is a little kid's router toy. This is a piece of furniture which is held together with these 3D printed connectors from open wood. This is, uh, you know, some uh, stencils that were put in by one of our Casa Yasmina artists in residence. There's like a work on design, you know, some leftover stuff to draw with, uh, bare plywood, paints, a little bit of stencils that kind of match this Victorian thing. And, you know, and they're kind of, uh, it just has a kind of, I don't know, it actually has a look and feel now, uh, which I'm kind of happy with. I mean, I, I didn't know what it would look like, but I'm the curator of Casa Yasmina, so it's kind of up to me to decide what belongs in there and why it should be there and why it should sort of make sense. Here's some other little objects, also from Playwood. Um, you know, furnishings, laser cut plywood, a lot of vegetation, the garden's becoming a big deal now. People are working on projects in there, they come in and display them like these. They're taking them to the Salon de Del Mobile, bringing them back. Sometimes they're there for a few weeks, sometimes they become more permanent. But you know, we have, we have a lot of these ongoing projects. You know, here's like some objects in the bedroom, typical kind of, I don't know, I mean that's the Casa Yasmina look of, of 2017. What it's supposed to do in the future is like a, a big open question for us. Um, but this is what you see as a kind of a member of the public. If you walk into Casa Yasmina, you're suddenly confronted with this, you know, set of objects and services, which they don't look, quote, futuristic, but it's because they're not corporate. I'm particularly keen on, uh, because I think uh, uh, that when you make your own home, you know, it should, it should be, it's personal, it's always personal. So, uh, and uh, I know, uh, when you have the Harrod, when you have stuff, you know, you kind of like it, but it's too much. It makes it like the house of your parents, and we all have the houses of our parents and grandparents, you know. What I like about uh, this approach, which we found out coming up, is that you can take something from your grandparents or your parents you want to keep, you know, and put different lights in it, you know, retrofit it, like turn a, a Hoover into something else, you know. You can, you can really keep only the emotional part, you know, without keeping the mechanic part, or vice versa, you know. This is like when we had Share Festival last year in Casa Yasmina, it was called, uh, it's a fine art festival, fine art, electronic art festival, in Ka but it had to be for a home. So, we had like paintings, you know, paintings which were virtual paintings, like many collections, like Sedition is a virtual, uh, it's a gallery of virtual paintings where you buy a virtual painting, but you buy it in a limited number, for example, we have that, you know, and we had people who were doing virtual art, you know, electronic art, on the walls, in the corners, there's no reason you cannot have it really. You know, I mean, it's like, because I get always bored of seeing the same painting that my grand, even though it's valuable, you know, that you inherit or the same piece of furniture, but if you can intervene on it, and this is like the line that I uh, really like in Casa Yasmina, and it, it doesn't look fancy in a way that it's uh, only for rich people, you know, or something that you want to sell. It's for you it's fancy, and for you it's important. You know, and my shit is not your. I mean, you, your grandma is different because everybody likes. Everybody has his own good, but mostly bad taste. You know, and mess. You know, this kind of. I like this fact that the people who enter there, 
uh, uh, they expect God knows what, you know, maybe house of the future, but what they like is we can make a party, we can make a meal, we can invent our own cocktails, you can sleep there, you know. This is, uh, you can, uh, you know, how often we have people who said, can I leave my smart object inside? So the curator that becomes like, I don't really know, you know, I just sit on it. I see if it works for me, it's that, you know. But then he started like curating it, and, and these are different levels of uh, giving it, uh, creating this total work. Yeah, I've been noticing when people drop by, they want to contribute, which I think is important. It's like they stay in this space and they say, well, I want to do something, you know. Like, I want to I wanna do something. But that's not something you would do in a museum, and that's not something you would do in, say, the Google House of the Future, because there is a Google House of the Future and a kind of tourist, the Salon de Del Mobile, and it, probably cost half a million dollars. You know, and it's full of like Android gear and kind of Google Home stuff and Google thermostats and the rest of their stuff. And they can set it up and they can tell people, you know, here's your home of the future, all you have to do is buy it from Google. But it's, you know, lifeless in the way that like an IKEA display space is lifeless. Whereas Kazi Yasmina is not lifeless. It's not a museum, but it actually is it's like a prototype for an alternative way of life. It's like you can you can scale it up. Now, you know, the, the main problem with like open source furnishings or sort of open source domesticity is that it's expensive. I mean, you know, IKEA is very cheap because it has the advantages of mass production. But you could build like, oh, you know, uh, uh, an entire social housing structure with the stuff out of Kazi Yasmin. If you had the capital for it, you could just build an Airbnb hotel with like laser cutters in the basement and just like make hardware kind of on demand. You could have people stay in the places and sort of say, I'm tired of this table. I want like a different one. It needs to be shorter. And you can deliver it. I mean, you can just like make it and carry it around. Okay, it didn't cost us anything to do it because we have the Torino Fab Lab there basically providing us with free engineering and free labor. But you know, I think you could actually put it together. I mean, I think you could scale it up. Okay, here's the Internet of Things landscape of 2016. We're an Internet of Things enterprise, but we're like a social one. And we're not an art group. This is us. And this is our little corner of the IoT landscape. Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Little Bits, Aid of Fruit. These are people who are kind of our collaborators in the IoT industry. We're in a tiny corner, this corner, <laughs> this corner here. We're in the kind of parts and kits corner, right? But we're not on the museum corner or the Airbnb corner. We're actually like a social outreach thing for the for the for the zealots who occupy who occupy this area right here. And believe me, there's a lot of big, hairy social political problems in there. First, yeah. Women live in homes and like women are having these technologies pitchforked onto their heads and they're not being told about well, how they actually work or what they do to the structures of family or you know gender issues. And also, just like the place is just infested with thieves, bandits, rip-off artists, you know, all kinds of surveillance marketing mechanisms are in there, uh, you know, a cyber war to the knife everywhere. This is the Trump of new world now. It's, not the, you know, flat internet world of the 1990s. We're on Airbnb. We don't use Uber, thank God. Uh, but, you know, we nevertheless put ourselves on Airbnb because we wanted it to be a place that somebody on the network could access. You can actually, people do, they don't do it every day. Every once in a while we get, like, a hacker who's like, I'm in Torino anyway and I need a place to stay and some stranger shows up. Most of the people who stay at Casa Yasmina are friends of Arduino or, uh, or or the Fab Lab, but it was important to us to put it on the list, and it's pretty cheap. I mean, eighty-two dollars a night—that's not bad. It went up. I saw, I oh, saw, good. Because we had also, but the last time Maybe we were getting good recommendations. Yeah, a month ago, it was so good because we were there <laughs> meeting. Um, we were meeting our friends who wanted to see Casa Yasmina, Morozov, Evgeny Morozov, you heard him, and Fra what's called Francesca Maria. Francesca Maria, yeah. 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 She's like, so we wanted to, so we said, okay, they wanted to do Casa Yasmina, and uh, there were people sleeping there. But, you know, we, <laughs> they, they, we go there, you know, we're like, uh, sometimes we sleep there, and, they, and 
people come to see us, we're like John and Yoko in there. <laughs> Just this man. Well, yeah, you know, never mind, you know, say hello. They say, this is Bruce and Yasmina from Casa Yasmina. So, you know, it's fine. So we're in there. And all of a sudden, these people who are not connected to uh, Internet of Things at all, you know, who were sleeping in the, in the rooms, you know. Uh, and while we were talking, they came at our table, you know. And we have, uh, I have this... Uh, very smart idea, I hope you will love it, to make a smart faucet of Prosecco, you know. Because Prosecco, it's very simple, it's doable, they said they can do it, you know. Prosecco, it can be made easily, you know. So, And Prosecco is the official drink of Casa Yasmin, and Bruce always like to use Prosecco for his tremendous cocktails, you know, that he's making. So they all came to the table, you know, and they sat at the table. I said, come on, sit here, you know, like drinking the Proseccos. And it was a party, you know, all of a sudden it was a party with guests of Casa Yasmina. It wasn't something we arranged, you know, but then there's music, we start doing music, making soundtracks for Casa Yasmina. You know, we'd like to invite Brian, you know, why not, you know, he, he might come to Casa Yasmina and do a little soundtrack made of Casa Yasmina. Subsonica does Subsonica come, guys, yeah, yeah. Yes, you know, Keen so, like but it's not anything, we don't have a budget for that, we just get the ideas and, and Really, uh, when there's, well, it's bottom-up things, you know, and I think that, uh, you forgot to say that, but I think that the people, even uh, people perceive, perceive us most as an art project, you know, even though it's not an art project, you know, we both do art, so, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's like... Well, it's, like, it's, it's sort of easier to think of it as an art project, but there aren't many art projects that are on Airbnb. Uh, yeah, it's like art is life. Oh yes, there is the, the guy who was cooking uh, as an art project. What's his name? Right. Uh, that was making dinners, a conceptual artist. Yeah, Rick Red Terrabond. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's like maybe from the 60s, 70s, art is life, life is art, you know. Uh, the last century that was this concept going. But now it's coming more as a, let's say, we don't have a business model. But definitely the business model of capitalism is over. Okay, so what we're having now is we have some kind of uh, opportunities, if not camps. Okay, camps the business model of capitalism is not over. Well, okay, it's a new capitalism. <laughs> but, but, you know, what's actually, well, over, what's actually right. over is more like the business model of the early uh, uh, fab lab situation, where you right. come in and just like put a bunch of machines into a building and have the hobbyists show up. On the contrary, I think you're going to see fab labs like becoming more chic. And like a fab lab really ought to have a coffee shop with it and probably a restaurant and also, yeah, a residency. I mean, this is a fab lab residency, right? And it's what a residency would look like if most of the objects and services were created in fab labs. So if you're in Italy and you're making like, you're in a fab lab and you're making these things for the home, where are you going to put them? I mean, you can't retail them through Ikea. You need a distribution chain, right? I mean, you need to make them, you need to sell them. You need to sort of like have social outreach with people. Uh, you know, you need to create open source hardware uh, in the way that like open source hardware uh, software has been treated. There needs to be tech support. There needs to be customer support. I mean, it's different from the kind of capitalism that Yasmina was talking about. It's not the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft model, but it is a model, right? And it could actually scale up. I think I think there could be it could be pretty big. And it can be big in Torino because there's a lot of empty space here. And you know, as European cities go, you can actually just loft out a lot of these buildings that are sort of sitting and falling apart. And you can put together these kinds of new and alternative methods of living and sell them. I mean, people find them attractive. They would actually come in there and live. They would participate, you know, they would sort of carry on in new ways. And you know, you'd have a generation of people who are in co-working spaces, and now they're in co-living spaces. You know, and the whole thing would be kind of okay. So, you know, that would be our victory condition. We don't want to be famous as like artists doing performance art in Torino. And, you know, commonly we're not even in Torino. I mean, most of the time, Cousy Yasmina runs by itself. And it's got its own staffers and its own people. And, you know, commonly we're in the USA or, or in the Balkans, and we're just not around. But, you know, we've learned things from it. And this is kind of job number one. This is our own house. Right. This is not Casa Yasmina. This is our house uh, in Campidoglio, uh, we, you know, which we built over a couple of years. But we're like, okay, now that we've lived in Casa Yasmina, why are we pretending that our bed's not an office? You know, I mean, because we're like working in the bed. You got this really nice bed, which is basically identical to the Casa Yasmina bed. It's an IKEA bed, but we're like, look, we're in here doing all this weird internet stuff. 
we've got all these strange Internet of Things, feminism things going on. Why don't we just attach all the hardware to the bed? Just like drill holes in the bed and just be very open and honest about it. You know, just literally just graft the hardware. I mean, this is an Internet of Things domestic bed space. And you're like, if you don't like it, you toss it on and you stick on another one. Right? Just, you know, they don't fall off. They don't catch fire. We know what we're doing. You know? So we're like in there in the morning. It's like, okay, get up on, you know, get on the Internet, come do the things, turn the fan on, turn the lights on. Turn the projector on. We're watching movies on the ceiling in our bed, right? You get yeah, you distorted. You get. It's amazing how many things uh, when you start like with a uh, with one suitcase. Right. You know, how many things you don't really need? You know, once you don't have it. You know, it's and it's uh, not only clothes. You know, it's also. Mm -hmm. Technology. It's. It depends, of course, on the habits you have. But sometimes it's very nice to change the habit. Sometimes you don't have to travel to change the habit. But you, you see, know? this is plug and play. We didn't buy a bed that was a smart bed with everything built into it, mm -hmm. right? And we're like running everything on this bed, and we like get rid of everything on the bed. I know, and this is our marriage bed. I mean, this is the, sort of the core of our of our very intimate relationship here. But we've like managed to come up with a method to kind of like fold that into our daily lives, you know? And if you would look at this from the point of view of the 1980s, yeah, this is a house of the future. It's a very, very futuristic situation. It's really, really weird by the standards of the 20th century, but it's pretty much nothing compared to what's coming, because there's just heaps of this. It's like, there's hundreds of millions of dollars being poured in all over the EU, you know, just making these efforts to kind of come up with a European version of a digital society. Uh, and we're like a small part of that, but it's like, these are just like huge things waiting in the wings. Now, you actually can make your own furniture if you're in the mood to do it. It's much more interesting to make furniture for 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 than it is to just make it by yourself. But, you know, the, the, the means of production the barriers to production have crashed. You can really do a lot of stuff if you're willing to devote the time to it. You can't make it pay in conventional commercial ways, but you can actually intervene in people's lives in different kinds of ways. Right? And think, uh, you know, we're we're believers in that. I think we're not. Uh, I think we're living in feudalism. You know, or like technological feudalism. It's post-capitalism. This is like the 99% story. And I think that young people uh, like you are, you know, like I had a daughter who was young, that she, even though she managed to get a job, which is incredible, like for everybody, that she got a job, like of course her job, payment for a highly educated person, is like one third of the pension of an Italian pension of her grandma, for example, you know. And of course, with that kind of money, she can't get mortgages, she can't get buy new stuff that, you know, you people used to do once. And at this point, the only thing is like, Really, to be creative about it, you know, and to to to, it's not like it's ever gonna get back, you know. What what? Uh, and she, and of course, you have to make your own life. Otherwise, you, she, she cannot inherit because she's working in this young entrepreneur uh, firm, where most of the people give up because the pays are too small. You know, they're, they're called digital group. So, so they go and live with the grandparents who will give them that kind of money and they will inherit the house, you know. So economically speaking, if you have a grandparent like that, it's better. But psychologically speaking, it's terrible, you know. You're, you're in your tomb, but at the age of 25, you go back and live with your grandma, help her out, you know, to die, and she will leave you her, she will feed you with her pension and leave you this flat full of shit, you know, her, her stuff, her life. What kind of life is that, you know? And this is the model that is uh, going on very much in Italy, very much so, you know, because of these differences between the pension and the pay, you know, and who can get, uh, and, uh, and also in most parts of Europe, you know, different in the US. But Europe is an old continent with old habits, which I really love. I'm European, especially I'm half, you know, I grew up in Italy, so I consider myself Italian. And I think why Torino, why Italy? It's because Italy has a lot to offer to uh, the concept of uh, quality, everyday life. You know, it's really, it's the model of the whole world. You know, as kind of, if, if you, as a concept, 
you know, how you eat, how you drink, how you sleep, how you socialize, you know, but what it has lost in the meantime is this kind of, let's say, business model. It becomes, Italy is becoming more like Venezia, like a show, a theater, you know, an expensive theater where you go to spend one day in Italy, you know, like a tourist, and then you go to see in Torino La Sindone and you see Casa Yasmina, you know. I hope we, you know, we're on the same level soon. <laughs> well, we're not the Sindone. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, the, the austerity's been very harsh. You know, there's a depression which is sort of lifting a little bit. But you know, the, the pre-2008 era isn't going to come by. And I think Yasmin is correct that we're entering an era of digital feudalism, which is you know, basically um, dominated by Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, who are the dominant industries of the current era, and are going to stay that way for a while. But you know, at least Uber is coming apart at the seams. So a lot of the things that they want to do are not going to actually work. And uh, you know, I think there's actually a lot more room for social innovation in Europe in the coming decades than there was in the decade before us. Because you know, the US is now kind of absent without leave in some areas, and Britain is like throwing themselves off the edge of the cliff. So there's actually a lot of breathing space in, you know, in the European Union to do stuff and get global attention for it. So, you know, how is that going to happen? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just know it when I see it. And this is what I saw outside of Italy yesterday. Okay, Italy, right? It's like the retail arm of the slow food movement. Here you can see they're using, they're using this uh, open source furniture uh, to put on their, you know, fake garden in front of the Italy. And this has become like one niche where things actually getting, getting some traction. This looks almost exactly like the furniture that's in the Casa yeah. Yasmina garden. We had it uh, they did it. Uh, yeah, they, they may have actually learned this Casa from Yasmina. us. They yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, that's like the commercial mainstream version. There it is, right, okay. You know, here it is entering the kind of retail bloodstream, of like, okay, guys in Italy are pretty hip, you know, they're like aware of this, they're like, Okay, you need something heavy, you need something third, sturdy, you need, it doesn't matter if it gets dirt on it and you need to be able to throw it away afterwards. Okay, yeah, open source furniture may be for you. Just like, send the guy to prints, they cut it up, you nail it together, staple it, put in some zip ties, there it goes, everything's cool. You know, it's like there for three days and then you just like the whole day and it composts somewhere. Okay, you know, this is, Okay, this is not the full answer, but it encourages me to see it because this is like a little sign of the thing, kind of like coming in like black water. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna come in like black water, you know, and we'll never give up. I mean, she and I will like never settle for you know a, a kind of conventional shrink wrapped life that's just not in the cards for us. But we like comfort, you know, please. I want to say that we all like good life, we all like comfort. And that's why I always say, like, when you do a, a, a technological innovation, and I really heard it from women, this from when I did my workshop on Internet to Women Thing, it's like, every, every, for me, it's the most important thing about this, uh, doing Casa Yasmina and technological revolution for demotica. The, 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 the product that will have success, uh, even as money, issue or like being famous or, or being accepted, it has to be accepted but culturally by the population, you know, of, of the town maybe, maybe not even country, because I, I always give this example in Serbia where I come from, uh, people like to brew their own coffee, you know, grind their own coffee, then they sit at the table silently, take a cigarette, take, you know, this is a ritual which is very important for the Serbian population. Yagoro, we just came from Belgrade, we know how it is, you know. In Italy, you know, they want that, uh, they were telling me, you live in Italy, they have this very short express, and they need quick, quick, but it has to be perfect, because otherwise they kill. You know, they kill it. the espresso is not good. I, I hear them fighting in the pubs, you know. And then there is US. In US, they just like to press the buttons, you know. They press the button, they quit, the, they walk with the coffees, one after another, one after another. They're, you know, they, they want the big, they want the mobile, they want the buttons. So if you make a coffee machine, a smart coffee machine, you know, it has to be different in Serbia, in Italy, and in US, you know. And this is, and you can do it smart. 
And you can do it locally, and you can do it with brilliant people around you, it, it, like in five labs, you know. But they, you have to tell them what to do, you know. I have great. They usually those engineers, those makers, they're not enough. Uh, they don't think out of the box enough, you know. And then that's why you bring other people who are not engineers, and they say, "Look, I want something." They say, "Okay, maybe I say something stupid." You know how many stupid things I said? I was. But my only good point was that I was not ashamed. You know, because it was my task, because I have so I can say all the stupid things, you know. But then you find out that they say, well, you know what, it's not, I can do it. You know, I can actually do it, you know. And this is like uh, just, it's, it's really brainstorming, brain living. <laughs> Story. Yeah, you know, and, Story. And, and it helps if you're willing to lead. And, I mean, it's been us right to say that there's a lot of cultural context that people will sort of fight to defend. And that's like the success story of the slow food movement in Piemonte. It's like, okay, the fast food movement is here, McDonald's is going to crush us, we must rally and fight back in some other way. And they did. Oh, I mean, slow food's really big and in better shape than McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. And, and nobody now would say that really fast food is the future of food in Italy. I mean, that's just not gonna happen. It's not gonna get faster and cheaper and beat everybody else out, okay? Uh, but, you know, another thing is just, like, be willing to declare yourself and just go ahead and, you know, be the pioneer. I mean, if you say you're the house of the future, in some way you are the house of the future. If you're willing to live it, that's going to be your future, right? So, and, you know, and people in Torino could do that. I mean, traditionally, Torino has led in these situations. I mean, what happens is there are social innovations in Torino that are financed in Milan and legislated in Rome. And the attorneys are super inventive. They, they, they never make all the money from it, and they end up getting politically dominated by somebody else. But, you know, this has been going on for hundreds of years in Torino, and there's no particular reason that it would stop now. Yeah, that's why I guess Torino was uh, our kind of spontaneous choice, because it suited. But also, Torino has this also in music and other things, you know, like uh, the way you see for the first time, it's new things. It's it's here. It's in Torino. It's not like it's not commercial. We, we, you go to a club and you hear some people. I do music. You know, people like five people sitting there. You know, and ten playing. And then all of a sudden, in a couple of years, it becomes a hit somewhere all over the world. But you know, I've been seeing it before. In, you know, other branches of uh, uh, here, people are curious. I think to do you something. Know, and they're and they're like this. I mean, we said we're Torino's house of the future. Even though we've got like robots, and you know we're from Texas and and from Serbia, but you know the Turkeys actually like like Kaza Yasmina. I mean, the press likes us. We get La Vazza came there. Yeah. Bankers like La it. You know, astronauts love La Vazza gave us free coffee. We got yeah, like a free La Vazza coffee, coffee machine. Just to, yeah, you know, they're we're like, having the machine. They're very kindly and supportive. You know, and they're like kind of cool about it. Yeah, if we had Italy La Vazza, I mean, what Fiat need? Now fear is gone. <laughs> right. But yeah, but it's... <laughs> well, you know, okay, so you know, that's the story of Kazi yes. Yasmin and, and pretty much all we had to say, yeah. except for one concluding thing, which is, you know, we're about to go on a lecture tour here. We've got to go to uh, Los Angeles, where we got married, to uh, Art Center College of Design, and confer with some people there about the project. And I also have to, like, write an article for Make Magazine about Kazi Yasmin. And we're trying to imagine what like a Casa Yasmina 2.0 would look like. I mean, it's, it's pretty well done. I mean, we said it was a two-year project and that we wanted to build a hospitality suite where people can show maker things. Okay, we could leave to Reno and never come back and it would work just fine along that line. So, you know, the question is sort of like, what, what further project should we try? Or what should we do having done this? And uh, there we really don't know. And we're really open to suggestion. So that's all we have to say. And, and maybe you can ask us questions. Thanks. Th thanks for showing up. <laughs> thanks a lot. We did a presentation in Barcelona a while ago. They loved us in Barcelona. Barcelona, Barcelona's got a lot of the problems or opportunities in the that Torino yeah. does. It's full of maker people and kind of weird left-wing Catalans. They've, they've got a lot of maker gear going on in Barcelona. Yeah.
Drangus, any questions out there? Comments, hints? You want to give us some advice? <laughs> any question? Hi! Next lecture. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but we invite you to come to Customs. You know, it's like yeah, there, on by. there is always somebody around. Uh, you, you can't really open it, but you guess. But yes, yeah, just uh, you, you might not know because this is a, a news that is quite recent. But from third uh, of July, there will be Polytechnico also there in Toolbox. So right. It's there will be a. A new laboratory. It's called Full Future Urban Legacy Lab. Right. To be full of. Uh, Italian. The, Italian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an interdisciplinary laboratory. So we, as Nexa, are involved there. So I think you might, uh, if you ask Juan Carlos to give you some contacts, it might be interesting to create uh, new interactions. And on, uh, let me check. I think it's on. Uh, um, we have also a date for the presentation in Toolbox. The fact is, uh, in case you might be interested to, to join, uh, and uh, let me check. Uh, should be 4th of July in, in the morning. Yeah. There will be a presentation in Toolbox. There will be a when presentation of the, this uh, new lab. Not, yeah. we're, we're, we're ah, here. Here. not here. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, but yes, you but know, I, yeah. this lab uh, will uh, will land over there very. We had polytechnical students. We have polytechnical groups. Uh, we had uh, uh, they come there and you know with workshops more or less. It's not anything new, you know. But but, but this uh, is a permanent uh, yeah uh, permanent yeah. presence. Yes, yes. I mean. So so maybe we'll have a diploma. Ha! Because I have a diploma, you know. Uh, are you going to uh, make people graduate? Yeah, why not? School? Who cooks good? I think it's yeah. better. I'd be that because Who makes me a uh, smart faucet uh, of Prosecco gets a diploma? <laughs> 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 yes, who does it first? Then they're done and that got the t shirt. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that part of the uh, appeal of the thing is that it's a house and not like a training center. You know? I mean, it's a place that looks like women and children live there. It has a children's room, even though there's no children in it. Just because you know it, it's there to have the uh, affect of a family, and I, you know I, I think there there will eventually be domestic domestic outbreaks of maker culture in the home. I mean, we're willing to do it. Uh, other people are going to do it. It's more a question of like, I don't know. It's like, how is that? I mean, how do you civilize people? You know, how, how, how can we live the way we want to live, right? Without without having um, solutions thrust on us from the, from you know Facebook's boardroom, you know, and I don't I don't actually have a quarrel with Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. I do, I do but they're the same quarrels that I had with AT and T or General Motors or International Telephone and Telegraph or other kinds of gigantic American conglomerate corporate structures, you know. And they're they're super common in the in the uh, in the uh, culture of my home country. I mean, that's just how Americans arrange things: gigantic railroads, gigantic you know uh, spaceship problem. You know, the international super highways. I mean, we've got we've got a lot of resources and the continental scale stuff, and we like to build things that are you know big, huge, and aggressive. And uh, you know, that's not the way everybody wants to live, and it's not even the way that a lot of Americans want to live. Well, in my country, we have nothing, you know, because we went through the war of destruction. So we have a lot of hackers, and it's like China, more or less. And people are hacking stuff, and it's like really an opportunity because you can't buy a new bulb, you hack how to make a bulb, you know, like simple stuff. And I think Italy is between. It has a really good thing that it can suffer the crisis, but also having the tradition of like uh, technology and everything. It's really the best place to do the combo, you know. This, that's why I think we did the thing here and not nowhere else, you know, between all the opportunities. Anyway, I think we're running out of time. There's a new lecture. Do you have a lecture now? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, thank you Thanks for coming. Then, you know?